My name is Caitlin. I work here at the Northfield Public Library. I'm super excited um, to be able to introduce our speakers today um, and for us to be able to host Ann Winkler Mori and Robin Wansley today um, in support of Ann's book and the amazing story that I think she has to share with us today. So um, Ann Winkler Mori has a PhD from the University of Minnesota and taught history and ethnic studies at colleges and universities in the Twin Cities for three decades. In the 1980s, she was the director of the Central America Resource Center in Minneapolis, and in 2010, she was instigator of the National Ethnic Studies Week. Her Minneapolis interview project includes 100 life stories with a social justice lens. She lives in Minneapolis with her spouse, David. In 2011 to 2012, they rode the contiguous perimeter of the United States. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Allegiance to Winds and Waters, Bicycling the Political Divides of the United States is her story of that trip. And Anne is joined by Robin Wansley today. Robin is an independent Democratic Socialist representing Ward 2 on the Minneapolis City Council. Before winning her election, she was a community organizer focused on labor, housing, police accountability, public education, and gender and racial justice. She grew up in Chicago and attended Carleton College graduating in 2013 with a BA in Women and Gender Studies. Great, so thank you. Um, like I said, we're excited to hear your story. I do just have the one mic, so I'm gonna have you kind of pass back and forth if that works for you, and, and I'll let you get started. Thanks. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, Caitlin, for the introductions. That's like first part of the agenda. Um, I just want to share a little bit about how I know Anne as well. I met you in 2019? Just before the pandemic began. Yes, yes. Um, Caitlin mentioned in Anne's bio that she's done this phenomenal project called the Minneapolis Interview Project, where she's collected oral testimonies from so many key leaders and just amazing people all throughout Minneapolis who are doing transformative work. Um, and I felt honored to also be part of that collection and sharing my a lot of my journey of being here in Northfield um, and in Carlton, um, and also linking that to the um, uprising that ended up happening in the wake of George Floyd's murder, um, and played a really big role in collecting the on the ground testimonies from people who were. Um, responding to that moment and also looking to build for something um, much more equitable, much more just in the wake of those events. Um, so I'm just so honored that Anne would um, <laughs> let me interview you about now a sub subsequent project. Um, and I'm super excited um, to be able to be with you all today. Uh, since the theme of this this book is around bicycling. Um, I figure we'll do another uh, kind of group uh, activity since it's an intimate bunch of us. Um, and have everyone share like your favorite bicycling um, experience. And just as an example to, to kick it off, um, mine is gonna be quick because I don't know how to ride a bike. So I also found this to be hilarious that Anne would choose me. <laughs> with no uh, bicycling experience whatsoever. So I will say my most favorite one will be the day when I learned to ride one. Um, so uh, yes, if we could start from the front, if uh, you could share your name again and, and that favorite bicycling memory you have of yours. Yes. <laughs> my name is Dave. <clears throat> oh. yeah. Thank you for reminding me. Um, Oh, my, my name is Dave, is that about right? Um, and I come, I was gonna to respond to your thing about I uh, didn't know how to ride a bike. Um, I uh, never bicycled as a child. I always make the excuse I grew up in a farm or rode horses and rode tractors instead. But I did learn how to ride a bike uh, um, 18 years ago. And I put on uh, close to a thousand miles every year then up until uh, well, just uh, just a year ago, and now I'm still hoping to get back into that. My my favorite. Sorry to take so much time. My safe favorite is a, is a trail ride with a group in a nice wooded trail where there's uh, not too much wind and uh, maybe a little dabbles of sun, not uh, too hot, so cool and comfortable. 
<clears throat> oh, my name is Roberta, and I used to bike around town when I lived in Wilmer when I was a child. But um, that kind of went by the wayside. When I went off to college, I couldn't take my bike. I came to St. Olaf. <clears throat> so um, I don't have any spectacular bike rides to report on, but I've been keeping my bike in spite of my son trying to trying to take it away from me <laughs> and saying, you're too old, Mom, you can't do it. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I, I haven't ridden a bike in, in uh, quite a few years. I tried it. Um, but my, my memory, my earliest memory, uh, when my mother was teaching me how to ride a bike, I think I was, must have been around eight years old when we lived on in St. Paul on Summit Avenue, and we went down uh, where Summit meets the uh, Mi Mississippi River there, and uh, we were driving, uh, riding along the street there, and of course I lost balance, and and I went down that great big hill uh, at when Mississippi this was many, many years ago. It wasn't as built up as it is now and barred off and things. And and my mother was screaming. She thought I was in the river or what. I, I went quite a ways, but there were so many trees. I got stopped. I got, you know, scratched up and a little frightened, but it, it didn't stop me. But that's my very vivid memory of uh, of my bike riding. And uh, I, I rode a little bit after that. But then I, as I got older, I had a couple of bikes stolen and then I, I sort of it, gave it up. <laughs> well, I biked as a kid in the little town of Wilmont, Minnesota, where I grew up. And biking was the way kids, all kids, got around. Um, and then as I grew up and did all the stuff you do in the process, and uh, when I got on a bike again a few years ago, I couldn't bike. My knees were yelling at me. So I'm now uh, a walker. I've given up the bike for my indifference to my knees and my age and my common sense. <laughs> I'm John. I, uh, I learned kind of the hard way, too. My dad took me to an empty parking lot, put me on a bike, and just shoved me. So fear was a main motivator. But one of my favorite memories is when I was driving around Lee Center, biking around Lee Center, I would put the glove on the handlebars and the bat and the baseball, stuff like that. I just, just love that kind of a memory. I just have a my speed uh, trek. So it's not the greatest, but I do like biking around, so. My name is Karen, and I grew up in the Chicago suburbs and learned to ride a bike there and rode it all over town to the pool and everything. And then when I went to college, I was did not have my bike. I don't really know what happened to that bike, but um, I did not have a car during college or after I graduated. So I bought a bike and that was my car. <laughs> and I got around Cedar Rapids, Iowa on my bike. Um, and then after I had enough money to buy a car, I drove around and my first Christmas at my first job, it was so icy and this was a hundred years ago. So <laughs> you had to get a real Christmas tree but the, all the trees were frozen. So I had a party in my apartment and we decorated my bike for a Christmas tree. I grew up in Northfield and so I biked around a lot here and I didn't have a car till I was 30, but um, I continued to ride a little bit here and there. And then I, um, a couple of years ago, I tore meniscuses on my knees. And I thought, uh, you know, that's it. I'm not going to do this again. Well, a couple years, no, about a year ago, I went to um, Decorah, Iowa, and I was able to rent an e-assist bike, and I fell in love again. And I was hugging the bike, and I bought myself one, and I put over 200 miles on it, and it t took away my limp from um, the torn meniscus. So, um, anyway. Check it out. Those uh, those are amazing things. Your name? Oh, I'm Nancy. My name is Noreen. I'm here in Northfield. I don't have any bicycling stories. I don't remember much of riding one when I was a child or having any since. I'm just here to hear about their experience. 
My name is Gerard. Um, I can tell you about the first bicycling experience I had, kind of what you were talking about, was my mom chasing me across the backyard with a stick. <laughs> and it was my motivation to pedal. And uh, I, I rode into the lilac bushes off on the side of the yard. and It's kind of been a lifelong thing with me now. So. Well, I'm Janet. Uh, I'm here because uh, my son is kind of a fetish about biking. As a matter of fact, next weekend, not this, yeah, next weekend, he's doing the 200 mile ride that's around here somewhere. And I'll be one of his stops, I guess. I don't, I don't, I haven't got all the information. I've got it secondhand from, from his sister. Um, I never had a bike of my own until I was probably about Mm, 23. Um, I always wanted one. I, I too grew up on a farm and so yes the boys got a horse but I did not get the bike <laughs> I wanted and so I was a little bit piffed. So um, after I was married a couple of years my husband got me a bike and I biked very little. So um, I don't know where our son got his fetish for biking but it's, <laughs> it's good exercise for him I guess. <laughs> So I'm here to get a book signed for him. Okay. And I always like people's stories. <laughs> I'm Sophie. Um, I learned how to bike on the track at the um, middle school near my house that I didn't actually go to. Um, and then I like stopped biking for a while because my house is not situated such that we can really bike anywhere as like transportation. Um, so we would usually have to drive somewhere to bike. Um, and then like a couple of years ago, um, we tried to get back into it as a family. Um, and so I uh, re repracticed. Um, and we had a good, uh, good time riding around this, this um, special like wheels only trail thing um, in my town and that that was fun um, a lot of trees and stuff around so yeah. my name's Heidi I learned to bike in Lincoln Nebraska um, biking around a cemetery because uh -huh. we didn't have sidewalks in front of the house and behind our house was a cemetery with lots of quiet roads to bike on and my family lived for a time in Spencer, Iowa, small town, and um, it's become a famous family story now that we are taking a family bike ride. My sister, three years younger than me, um, was just learning, and we came up to a road, and my dad saw a car coming, and wasn't sure if Holly knew exactly how to work her brakes, so we reached over and pushed her over, <laughs> <laughs> and she fell. Um, over the curb and into the grass, so it was a pretty soft fall. But she looked at him like, <laughs> why would my dad push me off my bike? So he was protecting her. <laughs> good. My name is Eileen, and I grew up on a farm just outside of Northfield here, so I'm a native Northfielder, on a gravel road. Okay, ride a bike on a gravel road. I'm sure a lot of you have had that experience, but I am the youngest of eight children, and so I first started out on a tricycle, and then I got the hand-me-downs, you know, from my older brothers and sisters. But then I was in the eighth grade, and um, I graduated, if you will, from St. Dominic's Catholic School here, and my gift from my mom and dad was a brand new Schwinn bicycle, blue. And so my best friend uh, and, and high school classmate lived just down the road from me. And uh, we made many miles on our bicycles back and forth from uh, to each other's homes, to each other's houses. So, Thank you. Hi, I'm Eliana. Um, so they make these balance bikes now for little kids. And so my daughter learned to ride a balance bike. And so on her fourth birthday, she could just ride a two-wheeler and no sticks or chasing required. <laughs> uh, my name's Bill. I do a fair amount of biking. Um, in the last few years, it's been especially on the low traffic gravel roads. Um, but one memory I have from a number of years ago was bike touring across Wisconsin with my daughter 
who was on her first leg of her trip to go to medical school in Vermont. So we camped and biked across the state. And then I sent her off on the ferry. <laughs> I apologize for being late. Are we all sharing a memory about biking? Or Okay. Well, my name is Heather. I, grew, I live in Faribault, but I grew up on a farm in Iowa and did tons of biking just on the farm with a no-speed bike. Um, we had tons of long driveways, you know, circling the entire place. So that was what biking was to me. It was kind of confusing to get used to using gears as an adult. But, um, yeah, that's my fond memories of biking when I was a kid. I don't do so much now. My husband and kids do more together. Um, I love biking. I was an exchange student when I was a kid, and I got to bike all throughout northern Sweden, and it was a lot of fun just biking everywhere. Thank you. One thing I find interesting is that we learn so much about all of you, where you grew up, by asking this question about, isn't that interesting? So. You've all inspired me. So your story about falling in bushes uh, to learn for sure. I was like, oh, this sounds like great memories to have. <laughs> well, thank you all for sharing. Um, we're going to now transition into the dialogue phase between Anne and I. So you all can learn a little bit more about the book, which is why you're here. Um, and then afterwards, we're going to um, do a brief group activity again. I love group activities, if you have not been able to see. And then um, open it up for Q&A. Uh, but first, uh, first question, and throughout your, your book, you talk a lot about the major historical events that um, you know, shaped your analysis um, throughout your journey. And really wanted to have some space for you to talk a little bit more about, you know, what were some of those key major events um, that led you to want to embark over several years on your bike um, and, and, you know, document them more specifically because it's those documentations that have now led to the creation of this book. So wanting to know, yeah, what were some of those key events that, made you wake up one day, it was like, I'm gonna do this. It totally sounds fun. <laughs> Great question. Yeah, I think, um, you know, to do something that crazy, you, you, you need to have a sort of a, uh, a variety of different factors coming together, right? So um, one is that I did, I did as a teenager want to walk across the United States. So I had this sort of idea, you know, um, in my head. Um, as a family, um, David and I, our child and our niece, um, uh, did did a trip to uh, Colorado from Minneapolis um, in 2006. And you know, I thought we would not want to ever get on a bike again when it was over. And I didn't feel that way. I wanted to kind of con continue. Um, so I had that, and then um, then I got laid off. Um, and it was, you know, the, the sort of the nadir of the Great Recession. Remember the Great Recession? Um, and, um, you know, it was like, what am I going to do, right? You know, it was this is sort of the, the time. Um, and um, the thing is, I wasn't... Uh, what what was you, what you might assume is that I had the physical capacity <laughs> to do the bicycle trip, and I did not. Um, and in fact, um, getting laid off made me pretty depressed. Um, and so I was sort of got less and less physically able um, to do that kind of activity. But I was also getting more and more sort of desperate to to figure out. You know, I mean, well. <laughs> you know, people were doing crazy things, right? I mean, really horrible things um, as a result of the so-called Great Recession. Um, I don't know if, if you remember, but there were news stories about um, people doing really horrible things. And I thought, well, I can do something that's not going to hurt anybody else but me, right? <laughs> Just get out there and try. Um, but then I also had another agenda to the, you know, to the... Uh, 
I was, which, which had something to do with the job that I lost, um, which was teaching at St. Cloud State. Um, I live in the center of Minneapolis. I'm going to stand up. <laughs> um, and um, so I was commuting to, to St. Cloud, and my students were um, commuting from really small areas. So we were sort of meeting in this middle area, and I became very aware that, um, oh, and I was teaching a course, uh, a mandated course on race that, um, that students had to take. Um, and I found that in order to um, even begin to talk about racism, uh, we had to bridge the urban-rural divide that I had with my students, right? Um, and um, so I started to figure out how to do that, um, but, you know, by making a lot of mistakes, and, you know, whatever. So the learning curve was just as big for me as it was for them, is what I'm trying to say. Um, but but they and I started to figure it out. Um, and so to have that pulled out from me, you know, um, was was really hard um, because it was a very challenging job, but it was also seemed like it was really important. Um, and and so I thought, well, how do you how do you have those kinds of conversations? Um, and I knew about the magic of the loaded bike. Um, as somebody, I'm a very introverted person. Um, but I knew from our trip to Colorado that when people see um, you with a loaded bike with you know lots of luggage on it, um, they come up to you and they not only you know come up and ask you you know where are you going and how many miles, but they also um, seem to uh, you know they know you're doing something sort of extraordinary, and so that they want to tell you um, you know the most intimate things about you themselves. And it just kept, you know, that that's sort of amazing, right? You know, that you can have a, a an interaction with somebody and actually hear what's hurting them, you know, or what their dreams are um, in, a, in the span of five minutes. Um, so I had the, the magic of the loaded bike, and I also had the sentence, I got laid off. So people would ask me, you know, how can you do this, right? Um, and that would be the first, you know, the, I mean, how, you, how do you leave your job? You know, what do you do? And I said, well, I got laid off. And I would see people's shoulders kind of relax. Like, you're telling me something really vulnerable about yourself so I can share with you what's going on with me. Um, whether or not it had to do with employment or not, but you know, just um, there was that, that there was that opening. Um, so between those two things, I started to you know collect stories and feel like like uh, this was a project I could do. <laughs> but I also want to say, in terms of uh, you know writing the book, I didn't think honestly that we'd make it through Wisconsin. <laughs> um, you know, so, you know, we were on, we were, so uh, in terms of the, my plans for this book, I didn't, um, I started to take notes, right? Um, but I, I didn't, I didn't know we'd act actually make it and that there would be a full story. Um, and as, a, as it turned out, I had, uh, you know, 700, 800 pages of, of stories that I had to try to cull down and um, so. Um, one thing that really resonated with me from your experience in the book was you, you talk about the magic of a loaded bike. For me, it was the magic of a, a, a loaded backpack. Uh -huh. um, so in my uh, intro, I, you know, Caitlin shared I went to Carlton, but I have my own journey around like travels, not on a bicycle, um, but on foot. Uh, when I graduated at Carleton, um, I pursued a Thomas J. Watson fellowship where I traveled around the world looking at how countries were responding to growing incarceration rates. And some of the events that you raised around, you know, the great recession that led to yours, for me, it's 
you know, being originally from Chicago, growing up in a predominantly black working class uh, community in a extensively racially segregated city, which is Chicago, and from the age of one, visiting loved ones um, in prison because of continuous divestments that's made or were made by people in similar positions that I assume today elected officials in divesting in public education and housing um, and public health care. Um, and coming to Carlton, which was beautiful institution, but also a culture shock where majority of my peers came from households at that time. Um, the average income for my peers or uh, for them was about $200,000. And I remember there were multiple times where you know, we would have discussions in classes where I'm talking about spring breaks. I'm going to visit again, a loved one in prison. And my peers have never, they're like, what? I'm going to an island? What prison? What? And for me, that being the first time it clicked that, wait, this is not a universal experience. Why is this relegated to either people who look like me or people who are in similar economic conditions like me? And wanting to figure out, like, is this the case, not only in the U.S., which is the king of mass, mass incarceration on a global level, but are there other countries that's reconciling with this, doing things differently, innovatively? Who has the golden eggs of wisdom um, that I can collect and hopefully bring back um, to create change? So for me, it was the loaded backpack. I literally had, like, I called it the green machine. I got it from REI. I still have it to this day. I was like, I'm going to pass this on to my children. Like, it's a <laughs> symbolic thing. Loaded backpack, went to 13 countries in a year, went to see other people's prison systems, recidivist uh, programs, and all these things. But it, it made me think of your journey of a theme that's tied between it was, again, this issue of economic divestment, like the, the factors of inequality that exist within the United States. Um, and you wrestle with that in your book, like, again, seeing the divestments of the commons. And when we're talking about the commons, again, we're thinking public housing, public education, all of the things that are public assets that is supposed to provide everyone a quality and standard, you know, um, um, baseline. Um, you know, that means unionized workforce and all those things. So we'll love for you to also share some of the insights that you saw during your travels, like when you said when people shoulders relaxed after hearing you were laid off, that there probably was like, oh, yes, <laughs> I'm experiencing this too. So yeah, we'd love to hear your insights on that too. Yeah, uh, I love this question. Um, you know, as a bicyclist, um, we hog the commons. Um, so, you know, David and I have, were already thinking about these issues, but, but we're, for a very, very selfish reason, when you're, when you're bicycling, um, first of all, you're on the roads, right? Uh, you're on trails. Um, every single shelter, every single picnic table, you know, <laughs> every public bathroom, you know, you kind of uh, worship. Um, <laughs> uh, public libraries. Uh, we never passed a public library without going in if it was open. Um, and many of them were closed during the recession. Um, um, so we were really, really aware of the commons and um, uh, what they had to offer us. But more than that, we also um, noticed that communities that invested in themselves um, uh, were, the, were, were the places that we were safest. Um, and they were the most interesting, right? So um, there is a tendency um, to, you know, some, some places. Well, let, let me give you the example of, of waterfront development, which is something that we were thinking about. I, I don't know if, if um, you have seen this study that human beings, um, are happier when they have some access to water. Um, and uh, so we, we found that as we were going through, through these different communities that, um, that uh, you know, there were places where, uh, there were places that dreamed that they were going to get out of the recession by developing their waterfronts. Um, and then we went to some places that had 
done that. For example, Baltimore. How many, has anybody been to Baltimore, Maryland? Uh -huh. oh, you did, okay. So have you spent any time on the, the waterfront or, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's beautiful, um, but it's also ringed with these very high-class hotels. Um, and corp and uh, you know corporate restaurants and you know not local restaurants, the kinds the kinds of industries that don't um, that don't create uh, you know high you know livable wage jobs, um, and it was you know biking through Baltimore through these foreclosed communities, burned out communities. Um, to the waterfront, and then seeing this glistening, this glistening waterfront, um, it really sort of hit home that um, that all these other communities that were talking about creating these waterfront developments uh, were not uh, uh, um, going to be, be you know, they, they had to think about who was going to have these these resources and and who wasn't. I want I wanted to actually ask you because Northfield has um, a beautiful waterfront, right? Um, do you feel as though um, this is, it looks to me as though it is there for you, <laughs> for those of people who live here um, and, and people who come. Um, am, I, am I correct in that? I mean, it's really, um, it's, not, it's not exclusive, I guess, is the question, you know, right? People have access to it. Um, um, so we were th we were thinking about this. Began thinking about this at the beginning of the trip as we were coming into uh, Cleveland, which is on Lake Erie, and in the suburbs of Cleveland, um, uh, we had we never got to see Lake Erie. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we knew it was there, but there was no access to it whatsoever. It was all private, all right. And then the minute we hit. Cleveland proper. Suddenly, there were these beautiful parks, and we had we had access to the um, to the river. And I got kind of a little. I was wearing rose-colored glasses when I was in Cleveland because you know I was like, oh, there's parks, and there's a free museum, and um, you know there just seemed to be uh, you know so much investment in in the com in this community, right? Um, and and it is absolutely true that um, you know this is where the the um, first oil boom was was in Cleveland and and there, there were politicians who were like who were like Robin here who said oh we are going to make sure that you know you invest in the community so they did create you know all these these this public infrastructure um, but when I got back and when I heard about I don't. Um, what happened to Tamir Rice, a little 12-year-old kid who was, you know, murdered by Cleveland police um, in one of those beautiful parks that I, you know, had been so <laughs> enamored with. I started to think about, um, it's, you know, it's not just having those, having the commons, but it's also about access to them, right? And that's a job that we have constantly. In, in, in terms of um, making sure that we have access to them. The other thing that I was thinking about on the trip was that, um, you know, this, uh, this argument that we have, sort of the conservative, you know, progressive, whatever, argument about whether things, whether our commons need to be public or, you know, private or whatever, that that may not be the right question. <laughs> And that maybe what's more important is who has access. And that you know, a lot. I was in you know some tiny communities where um, you know they, there was um, you know different organizations that had created the shelter or created the picnic area, and and um, you know it wasn't the city. It was some you know business organization or something like that, and and it, it, you realize it doesn't matter who who created it. What's what's important is you know who who has access to it. So so I thought about the commons all the time. Yeah. yeah. And I think in kind of building upon that of uh, when you you're raising this matter of like access, yeah. I think one of the 
continuous themes that we've seen throughout U.S. history is any collective struggle has been around. How do you not only expand, one, expand access, because we know many of the commons, the tax on them has been to relegate access for some and none for others. Um, and the others is always defined around lines of race, around gender, around class. And that has always led to then, and this is the, the tradition that I come from while I'm in office, is through the collective struggle, through social movements have that have fought not only to expand the access to the commons, commons, again, like public housing through public education, but then to protect the commons themselves, um, the parks, even those things, <laughs> um, the roads. I mean, just three months into my term, and um, we had one of the biggest fights on council was uh, making sure that transit riders had access to 24-7 bus lanes. And we, for years, were able to build broad support around that. And we have um, a very reactionary leadership right now at the city of Minneapolis that fought against ensuring that every resident that we know are predominantly students, that are black and brown residents, working class people, they said, no, you should not have access to 24-7 bus lanes. We need to think about private or corporate business owners who are coming to the city, we need to create parking for them. So instead of 24 seven buses, we're gonna give you six hours. And knowing like that was a fight in itself just to say, why are we even fighting to have access to basic public transportation? And I would love to hear more from the, the 800, you know, stories that you collected throughout your journey um, the ways that people were also being resilient, people were being responsive, because, you know, these attacks, their ratification, or the compromising of these commons, be it through the development of a water, you know, shed or waterfront, or the, you know, you, you talked a lot about the Great Recession um, at that time. As a Carleton student, for me, what was very transformative in the moment of 2005 when the recession was happening was the Occupy Wall Street movement, um, where we finally had this big um, national awakening around the 99% versus the 1%. Why were the banks and all of the folks that created the housing crash in the dire conditions that we were experiencing, especially as college students that were you know, told, you know, if you went to college and you went to the Best of the best, I'm sorry for any of y'all who went to St. Olaf. Um, <laughs> it was like you went to, you know, best school, you did it, and then you're coming out into a US market with no job prospects and with thousands of dollars in debt. So you're coming into that and then learning that all of these businesses, maybe your family members' homes are getting foreclosed, like all of these dynamics are happening and the people who created these dire situations are getting bailed out and not you. So in response to that, we saw Occupy Wall Street. We saw people um, fight for additional political representation. That's where I'm able to be an independent socialist right now in Minneapolis because out of the Occupy Wall Street, people ran this independent socialists in Minneapolis to say, we can't have people in office that are in line with developers and with big banks and all of these industries that create economic turmoil. So we'd love to hear from the stories the people you encounter, how are they also responding and being resilient in the face of these attacks on the commons? During a really trying economic time during, like in history at that moment, and we're, of course, in another one of those trying times now, right? Um, yeah, well, we were actually traveling during, as the, as the Occupy movement began, and uh, had the amazing uh, serendipity um, experience of being in New York City <laughs> the day that uh, Occupy began. So not knowing at all, of course, and, and, and realizing that the people who were, who were organizing that didn't know either, that they were, <laughs> they were organizing something that was going to you know, spread across the country and, and spread to urban and rural areas. Um, um, but yeah, we actually stayed with one of the people who was 
an instigator of the first day of Occupy Wall Street. Um, and I went down there and you know watched what was and that, and that is in in the book. But even more sort of amazing is that then we left New York and we started you know going down through through um, uh, um, you know into to Washington. We got to Washington D.C. about a month later, and um, I'm, we went by the museum um, that had all the the um, front pages of all these newspapers and they were all about wa occupying <laughs> all these cities uh, across the country were um, were um, and there were these occupations of the you know the center of the city right um, and I think also what what's so 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 we watched that and we saw we met and we saw these occupations you know across the country um, um, and just saw the way in which the thing about that movement is that it was so flexible, so that you know different communities took it up in different, in, you know, in in ways that reflected their their issues. Um, um, and I think you know what I what I've seen since then is that that um, that the the social movements that have happened since then have really built on that on um, that movement and and again it it really was um, you know an answer to this um, um, the manufactured um, uh, difference differences between uh, you know su supposedly the divisions that we supposedly have right because if, if it's 99 percent right <laughs> that's that's a whole different thing um, um, yeah, mm -hmm. so. That's really awesome to hear. Yeah, like, you were there. <laughs> and, um, and again, I just have no, and I think for me that the question is again like seeing farmers, seeing like so many people again along political lines that we often think are in opposition to one another. We had a shared um, shared plight, where it's just like the economic system of racial capitalism that we all live under. That moment showed that oh, this system cannot support our collective well-being. Same of as you mentioned now in the, the wake of the pandemic and the ongoing effects of the pandemic where it's like, wow, we really don't even have a healthcare system that could prevent over a million people dying in this country or being able to deliver like economic support for the masses of people who were struggling also in this ongoing recession caused by the global pandemic. And just recognizing too of like, we are in one of the most wealthiest, powerful quote unquote countries in the world what why we can't have nice things why we can't have <laughs> parks for everyone why we can't have quality schools for everyone like these contradictions just don't make sense and i think for occupier in that moment people started to put those connections together whether you were a farmer in south minnesota or if you were again someone like me urban core of chicago that was living in northfield at the time like you're starting to put those connections together and it's powerful I think in your book you talk about how people were also making sense of that making those connections and then also working with e each other to figure out how to be responsive and building on that um, I think it's in those moments when we recognize that we are stronger together um, that we experience the most kindness and compassion from one another i think there's a lot of darkness that happens in our country and we're living in lots of dark times but what i think i was inspired by your travels is also like yes being able to meet strangers with a loaded backpack they don't know you could have been a serial killer they don't know nothing um, and they approached you and like extended the the utmost like hospitality to you and i have to say that resonated with me in my travels around the world like just seeing people i've never met in my life who've supported me in the most ridiculous times is like you don't owe me anything so we'd love to hear your favorite like meet a stranger story from your book <laughs> Well, so I'm going to 
to, yeah, well, so, so there were so many examples every day of people who saved us. <laughs> um, people who, I mean, literally saved us, you know, water, things like that, um, putting us up, that kind of thing. Um, and I kind of, that there were, there were kind of two different kinds of trail angels. So were the people who, who, you know, um, provided the, the b sort of basics that we needed. Um, and then there were the people who provided the lesson that we needed, you know, to understand um, um, this particular place. You know, they came with the story that just explained what was going on and what we should be looking for. Um, and this story is about somebody who, um, I think I'm gonna stand over here so I can flip my pages, um, who was, was in the, category of both. Um, and in this, in this segment, uh, I had been, what you need to understand is that I had been worrying for months about how we were going to get across um, West Texas, right? Um, really, that was the first place where uh, we were going to deal with miles and miles without services. So it wasn't so much how many miles we'd have to do in a day, but that there was no place to get water, no place to stop, you know, if we broke down, that kind of thing. And that really scared me, right? And so um, we, in this reading, we had just gotten through a day of, of 60 miles to a place that I, ironically was called Marathon, Texas. <laughs> and we had just created, you know, finished this marathon. Um, and, but I still didn't know what we were going to do. Uh, with the rest of West Texas. Marathon Texas was a great accomplishment, but ahead were unfathomable 75 and 90 mile stretches without water, exacerbated by mountains and wind. Still, we proceeded without a plan, hoping a solution would arise. Liz Rogers arose. She was well over six feet tall with a deep, gravelly voice and a John Wayne-like presence. She had read my blog and decided she wanted to meet me. Yeah, you, you wrote, everyone has a right to seek a better life, she rasped. No, I'm not sure I agree. I'm not for tearing down the borders. But I never heard anyone say that before. She invited us to spend a night in her guest house in Marathon, two nights in her casita in Alpine, and then secured us shelter in three more locations, breaking up those isolated stretches of West Texas. Liz was a federal public defender. During our day in Alpine, she took us with her to court, 100 miles north in Pecos, Texas. Driving 90 miles an hour through the parched heart of oil country, hands off the wheel, Liz talked nonstop. Governor Perry's leading prayer services asking for rain, but as you can see, she pointed at an oil rig pumping in the distance, our dwindling water supply has not halted fracking. We passed one car filled with Liz's law colleagues. They shook their heads as we left them in the dust. Water politics are complicated, she continued. Clayton Williams, he ran against Ann Richards for governor in 1990 wants to sell rights to the water under his ranch to the mid city of Midland, where George Bush lives. His neighbors are upset. The region's the driest it's been in 60 years. The Pecos courthouse was massive, like it belonged in St. Paul, not a town of 8,000. Liz introduced us to the security guard and everyone else in the building as she led us to the courtroom. We took seats in the back row, hoping the soup coat Liz lent David and the black winter jacket I'd bought in Del Rio would cover our incongruity. We wanted to slip in unnoticed, but Liz approached the bench, booming, Judge, I want you to meet my friends. <laughs> we stood awkwardly. The judge behind his perch talked animatedly about his favorite bike trails and gear. He's a buddy of George Bush, Liz would tell us later. He was gloating about his last race when nine Mexican men in jumpsuits entered the room, shackled at ankles, wrists, and waists like the legs of a giant orange caterpillar. No longer engaged, the judge looked at his roster, called a name. A man stepped forward and said, 
I apologize for breaking the laws of your country. One by one, the other men faced the bench and recited the same sentence. Liz did her best to unchain them with her words. They weren't criminals. Sorry for the emotion here. But people seeking a better life across the border. Each had an individual story. Liz towered and commanded as she pleaded their cases. Her partner, in a wheelchair, methodically developed their arguments. Their combined efforts seemed unbeatable, but they faced a dehumanizing system too mon monstrous for dedicated lawyers to overcome. 80% of my clients are immigrants, Liz told us as we ate lunch at a restaurant in Pecos. A few years ago, most crossed to find work. Now people come to escape the violence. They say, get me a two-year sentence if need be. Just don't send me back. I'll get killed. Recently, I've seen a new twist to the terror. They deport everyone to the same place. The drug cartels capture deportees and for force them to return with packages of drugs. Our food came. Liz counted the Weight Watcher points in her salad. It's 1939, and I'm sending Jews back to Germany. We need a refugee program for Mexicans today. But we're, we're moving in the opposite direction. They used to deport you. Now you go to jail and court first. If you re-enter, you have a criminal record. She paused. I voted for Obama, but I'm deeply disappointed with his border policies. More detentions, more deportations, harder, harsher sentences. The whole experience at the courtroom was surreal. I didn't trust my memory of it. Sitting with my computer on the couch at the casita. That night, I quizzed David. Did they really have shackles, as if they were dangerous criminals? Ankles, wrist, and waist, like something out of a concentration camp movie. Yes. Did the judge brag to us across the courtroom about his cycling speeds? Yes. Was Liz amazing? I never know when these things are going to no, get my emotions up. Apologize. <laughs> yeah. No, do not apologize. Yeah. Thank you. So, as you can see, Liz Rogers was that both, both kinds of trail angel. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think um, when you're talking to be the the title of your book is, you know, Political Divides. Um, and when you're traveling, I think one of the things that just came up from you sharing that excerpt of, you go into so many places with assumptions because what we hear off of CNN, you know, Texas, is just like, oh, I did not expect even that story to go in that way. And to know that there are literally people we've never met all across this country that are, again, doing this deep work of being resilient, of fighting against, um, you know, the criminalization that so many of our people are experiencing. Um, and you would never meet them or hear about them um, unless, yes, you decided one day in the wake of being laid off, it's like, I'm just going to ride a bike and be able to bring Liz's story to people so that they know there are angels in Texas, all over the US, who we can connect with to really bridge these divisions. Um, and that's powerful, that's powerful. Um, so thank you for elevating Liz's story and capturing it. not only Liz's story, but that of the immigrants who are also um, Deeply, like their realities are shaped by the mess that happens here in the US. Um, we wanted to have space for another excerpt reading. 
that was powerful. If there's another excerpt that you would like to share with the group or, well, that was, yeah, I that was, <laughs> well, we wanted to, again, allow space as a, for another group activity um, in light of that. Um, there's a, a section in your editor's note where you talk about, um, let me pull it up. The what you saw with just Liz, um, understanding how we thrive with insecurity as we dismantle oppressive systems have never been more critical. Um, and I wanted for us as a group to take a couple of minutes to think of the ways in which we're also showing up in so many moments of insecurity. Um, how we're not only showing up, but how we're thriving in those moments. Again, I, I, I yes. <laughs> um, and, and as an example, I think of being able to sit in front of you all today, almost 10 years out of a, as a alum of Carlton, growing up in Chicago, like under dire situ situations, and even just two years ago with the pandemic of both COVID-19 and also um, racial capitalism coming to a head with George Floyd's public execution um, and experiencing this revolutionary moment of, of that uprising that followed this racial reckoning that's been festering for decades and decades. All felt super dark in that moment. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, from Occupy Wall Street, there have been at least 10 years of efforts in Minneapolis to have an independent socialist in office, someone who can speak and fight on behalf of everyday working class people. And it was never made, it, it never came into fruition. And all of those events inspired me in 2020 to say, no, it's time to have that representation. It's time to have a champion for working class people, for black people, for brown people, for immigrants, in a space where decisions are made often without our input, without um, consideration how this will affect us not only months from now or just years from now. And being able to run in the wake of all that and win after 10 years and decades of, of pushback against that type of represent, representation, to be able to sit here as the city of Minneapolis' first black independent democratic socialism, socialist, that is a moment of thriving for me on behalf of my community and with my community. Um, so for me, that sits of like, we're not laying down and acting as doormats to all of the suffering that's happening around us. There are so many people who inspire us. We're inspiring others when we show up and say, we're not going to stand for all of these, these things that create that suffering and for those who are enacting that suffering onto us. So I at least wanted to share the ways in which I felt your story inspired me in this aspect of how do we thrive in the midst of insecurity. And as we're engaging in this task of dismantling those systems, oppressive systems that create that insecurity. So I want to give y'all like a minute to sit with that and think of if it's a story for you, a story that you've, or experience you've witnessed with even one of your loved ones. You mentioned your son back there who's about to travel around, you know, <laughs> 200 miles. like. Even your loved ones are doing phenomenal things. So just want to give us a minute and then we'll share out and then have Q&A. And I can allow if anyone is ready with a response. Yes. I want to give a shout out to our public library. They have been so awesome with the um, Latino, the Hispanic community. Um, and for years, um, and I guess I didn't realize it until I was looking at a couple of other communities that I was considering moving to. And I walked into their public library and I immediately tried to look for some 
some publications in other languages, other representations of other cultures, and there wasn't any. And this was a very um, affluent community. And I thought, um, maybe that they didn't have as many uh, Hispanic people living in their community. But I remember a time when I was a mentor for a, a girl that was from Mexico. And at that time, there wasn't, um, there on the map of Northfield, Viking Terrace was not a part of it. It was like it didn't exist. And that was, um, that was good 10, 15 years ago, but now it's, it's on the map. And um, again, there's just so many illustrations of how they're reaching out to that community that's within our midst. Um, I make several comments. I'm not sure they all direct the, uh, the question directly. <clears throat> um, I grew up on a farm on, uh, in western North Dakota, also very dry country. Uh, my dad was a homesteader. And uh, even though I was the youngest in the family, and my dad was one of the last homesteaders, but uh, the, uh, there's a, I see the... Um, the stratification of the community. My, my siblings tell me about, you know, all that the children went to school there, uh, all the people that were there. The homestead you had, oh, um, 160 acres you got. That's a quarter of a, um, a quarter of a section, quarter of a square mile. So theoretically, there could be three, four people in every mile of a street, of a road. When I've been to town too long, <laughs> when. Um, uh, I came along, the, uh, a lot of the homesteaders had left already. And um, uh, most, most of the relatives that my dad came out to homestead along beside uh, had all left. In fact, the last one had left uh, just shortly before I was born. And I've only seen that family uh, two times in my life. The, um, I don't know where I'm going with all of this. Uh, I've had a collective experience in a number of different places. I've worked on Indian reservations in the United States for 10 years and seeing all of the discrepancies there and the discrimination and the, uh, I, I ran an alcohol and drug detox and treatment program for one of those tribes for almost four years. And um, I'm not sure we did a whole lot other than keeping some people from freeze to death and uh, hopefully keeping to uh, trying to continue educating people about the dangers of alcohol and that sort of thing. Um, I learned a lot. Um, I'd like to think that uh, at least some of the, the, the out, uh, I, I went to one of the, uh, the uh, professional meeting uh, uh, nationwide conference that the tribe sent me to. And um, this uh, woman from one of the Indian tribes from southern Wisconsin was really buttonholing me about you know, how many um, Indian people were in my program uh, or employed in my program. And I went to them, because it varied a lot, because we got a lot of, of um, um, I've forgotten the name of the program now, that there were public funds made available for temporary employees. And a lot of those funds weren't being used. And uh, the, this particular uh, job program uh, knew that, uh, you know, I'd take practically anybody to, uh, that, uh, to hire practically anybody you could use. We had the money to do that. And so we did a lot of that. So the number of people we employed sometimes varied from from uh, five or six to uh, 27. So I was having difficulty uh, answering this question. And she's just really nailing me to the wall. And I said, um, I think the question you're really answering me is how many white guys are in the program? I said, I'm the only one. And that's what happened to the room. There was a dead silence. Everybody was shocked, I guess. I don't know why they were shocked. But, um, well, I got the, the, well, I had that job. That's a whole other story, but I won't bore, bar, bore everybody with. Uh, one of you made the, the comments about the, the rural to urban. Um, 
dichotomy and so forth, and coming from the areas I've had, and even still in Minnesota, uh, that is very much functional. Um, I was interesting about the, your, your uh, intrepidation facing all of the, the uh, expanses in western Texas. I wonder what you thought about uh, all of the North Dakota and Montana. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just rambling. Yeah, no, it, it really came to understand that whole geography. You know, it's 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 really the same. It's the same place, right? It's uh, 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 if you look at the map, right? It's north, north and south, but it's the same plains as the the Texas part and the Montana and and yeah. So I really f felt it. Um, anybody else? Um, <clears throat> I think Councilor Member Wansley's question was, how do you thrive in times of insecurity? And it, it just struck me, like, Anne, your, your response to people, oh, I got laid off, and how when we are vulnerable, it actually it can be the perfect time to thrive because it's that time to connect. And I remember um, Occupy Wall Street. I had just moved to New York. And I went down there, and I was a middle school English teacher at the time. And um, I was touring, or you know, they would they had like an actual tour you could kind of walk through on this path there. And they didn't have any kind of PA system. And so when there was one person who was going to make an announcement or had something to say, they would say it. And then everybody around would say it so that it got further. And um, I don't have any tidy conclusion to that, but that's what I was thinking about. I always worry about bike touring about the roads and having to compete with cars. I'd love to have bike paths, but we don't always have that. How did you manage that, or was that an issue? Yeah, and there were there were some places uh, we we almost really almost quit in uh, Northern Virginia, um, maybe basically because um, the commons there were were taken up by military bases, um, and at one point they actually allowed bicyclists through the bases. But they had closed them off, um, you know, after 9/11, um, and hadn't opened them by 2011. Um, and so, and but our bicycle maps didn't tell us that. So, um, so we were forced onto a, uh, a truck route that not only didn't have a shoulder, but it also didn't have um, a place to walk on the side. You know, it was all boulders. Uh, my my big uh, uh, my big tip. Okay, for being safe on bike touring is being willing to walk. <laughs> okay, um, uh, but that was one place where we couldn't even walk on it, right? So that made it very, um, very scary. And uh, we did many, many miles trying to figure out a way around. Um, so, uh, so that that was a that was a struggle. Um, and I worry about you know we do want to do the inner the inner circle. Um, and those states are even less, in some t um, from what I've heard, um, bicycle friendly <laughs> in terms of. So, um, <laughs> pray before you get on that. <laughs> no, um, you know, I I was really I I worried about it a lot, and I there were there were times when I I was I was like no you know I hear the trucks out there and I'd be like no we're not getting on that, <laughs> but then the thing is you know you get on your you get on your bike and um, it takes a lot of energy and that can kind of take up the energy of worry the worry energy and you don't see what's behind you. <laughs> There's one slide I have of the of big truck right right behind me and. I was okay because I didn't see it, <laughs> but um, but you know we we tried we tried to go the very safest route, but it was not always possible. So Is there yeah. Well, 
that that place in which we in which we almost quit in in Northern Virginia, there was you know in in addition to the truck issue was we had just crossed the Mason Dixon line, and I was a little bit kind of yeah I hadn't gotten used to it yet, <laughs> um, and we we were on uh, what what's the name? <laughs> I can't. The um, who's who's the history buffs, who's the head of the Confederacy? Um, Jeff Jefferson Davis. We were on Jefferson Davis Highway. Um, and it just seemed like, you know, that, that was the truck. The truck route was called Jefferson Davis Highway. And, and, and it just seemed like that that was part of what made it so horrible. Um, uh, lots of museums that, that venerated the Confederacy. And, you know, so all of that combined kind of made it, made it really uh, difficult, feel like, and we did, in fact, uh, we found a, um, a uh, van, you know, we found a van taxi that was in front of our, in front of our uh, hotel. I don't know how or why, but um, big enough to fit two bicycles, so um, we took it 20 miles out of this area to a very, very different, you know, very different area. So, but other questions for me? Okay. How did you? Uh, how did you find people to stay with when you did homestays, and um, are those the people you interviewed mostly? Yeah. Yeah, we did have. You know, there is a bicycle network called Warm Showers um, that we used. There was a. Um, international friendship organization that actually encourages two-day stays so that you really get to, you know, exchange. And so you really get a lot of free meals. Um, it was sort of an amazing, amazing thing. We used those two things. Um, we asked friends of friends of friends, you know, like, like, like Baltimore, you know, does anybody know anybody in Baltimore? I had a friend in Madison who had worked with somebody who is now living in Baltimore, and, and that's how I got, you know, a place to stay there. But we also had a lot of people, you know, meet us on the road, strangers, and say, come stay with us. Um, and yes, yeah, some, some uh, you know, I, like I said, I had many, many more stories than and, and many of the places that one of the painful things about writing the book was leaving out some of the most generous people <laughs> um, and not telling their stories. But, um, but they were, they were um, yeah, those are many of the stories, but not all of them, not all of them, so. I wonder if anyone has come to stay with you um, <laughs> as a result. Yes, um, both bicyclists and other people. And it's been kind of, um, you know, the, with the, the pandemic that stopped um, and we're just, we're just opening up our house again. <laughs> so, yeah. But I, you know, that was one of our sort of refrains. I just, you know, I hope you will come. I hope you will tell your your children they can come. Please, it would be nice to. But we, you know, we really kept thinking of that, uh, you know, the movie paying it forward because, <laughs> you know, the truth is you're not gonna you're not gonna pay back these same people. You just have to kind of have that. So we have a lot of karma that we have to repay. <laughs> You know, it's my 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 greatest dream that this book might might do a little bit of that. But anyway, anybody else? Yes. Well, I guess I don't really have a question, but I think I kind of missed the boat um, when we were discussing your question: How do we thrive in times of insecurity? And I, I guess just as part of that, I wanted to connect. Um, appreciated your comment early on about the park shelter in this small town who, um, you know, it wasn't uh, federal or government money, but it was individuals who had given to that. And um, we can appreciate that too. And um, so I guess for myself, I've been kind of uninvolved in politics most of my life. And I grew up Mennonite and kind of separation of church and state mentality, and maybe that contributed to it. Um, so um, I guess living in Faribault, kind of the biggest uh, community 
where there's a schism would maybe be the Somali community. And so um, I guess um, my husband and I, our family, have just been trying to be real intentional on an individual level. Um, well, what can we do? You know, maybe not politically, but just individually um, to make friends, to build friendships, and helping um, with repairs and English tutoring and citizenship tutoring, and just um, most importantly, just doing things together in our homes. And um, anyway, so I just wanted to just kind of emphasize, um, you know, the value. I appreciate that you mentioned the value of the role that individuals and um, communities play as well. And um, yeah, I just want to mention that. Thank you. It's just a quick question. Did you have any? Oh, I didn't. Wasn't expecting this <laughs> experience. Oh. Here, this is way different than what I thought it would be. Yeah. Um, well, my my. Um, you know, I I sort of I'm the child of a Holocaust su survivor. Right? Um, so I grew up with this um, very, you know, very, you know, he, I didn't uh, feel like, um, very uncomfortable with, with nationalism, okay, with, you know, I mean, my grandparents were, were very patriotic Germans who were then suddenly told, <laughs> "You're not, you're not German, right? You're not, you're not part of us, right?" And that experience for my father was, you know, and I inherited that, very uncomfortable with, um, with any kind of nationalism, and um, still am. But what I learned on the trip is that people have a connection to place that's lo local places, and often it has to do with geography, it has to do with um, ethnicity, it has to do with lots of things that have sort of been, been um, um, you know, uh, uh, say that again, <laughs> help me out. Yeah, yeah, in that, right, and, and in that community. And, and we've, we've, we've met people who were like, you know, I got to be on top of the mountain, and people were like, I got to be in the forest, I got to be on the prairie, I got to be in a city. <laughs> um, you know, we, we heard this on the, on the trip. Um, you know, the love of local places. And I also had the experience of, of not living in one place. I didn't grow up in, you know, Chicago. I didn't grow up in one place. I grew up in lots of urban places, but, uh, um, but very, very different. Moved around all the time when I was a kid. So this idea that people really have a strong identity with a particular place, um, and they want to share that with you so strongly. And at the same time, we heard over and over and over again, you know, you're safe here. Come here, come in, um, but be careful of the next place. Be careful of the next group of people, the next border, the next um, neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. And then we would, of course, go to that next <laughs> neighborhood, that next place, and we would hear the exact same thing. And when you do, you know, when you have that experience, <laughs> right? Um, you know, and you're like, wait, I just heard, <laughs> you know. Um, it's pretty powerful. Uh, you know, you, you realize that a lot of the fear that we have um, of the other um, is just so unfounded, right? Um, um, and you're just sort of seeing it on a daily basis. Um, so that was, that was, um, that was my big <laughs> ha-ha moment, <laughs> or moments, yeah. So is that, um, are you talking about allegiance to plays that related to the, that first part of the title, allegiance to winds and waters? Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk more about that. Yeah. Environments. Yes, yeah, yeah, that, it, that is what I'm getting at. That is why that, um, I didn't actually read Braiding's uh, Sweetgrass until 2020. I had all kinds of titles that I went through <laughs> as I was writing the book and then all of a sudden I read um, the quote, um, I need a copy of the book so that I can read it, but, um, but yeah, I just read this 
quote in her book, and I was like, wait a minute, this is it, this is it, this is what I'm getting at. So, so I'll read it to you. Let's see. What happens to nationalism, to political boundaries, when allegiance lies with winds and waters that know no boundaries, that cannot be bought or sold? Um, so that's, uh, and we, you know, we just had uh, Hurricane Ian, which didn't care whether it was Florida or Cuba or Haiti or um, Puerto Rico, right? Um, we've had uh, uh, wildflower, wildfires in Canada that have affected lungs in Minnesota and didn't care about the borders that they were crossing. So I think uh, you know there are lots of examples of how that. Um, at this moment, the borders that we've created, that human beings have created, uh, you know, don't address climate change. They don't address pandemics. They don't address the things that us us humans um, don't have. Don't you think that all the differences of people makes life fun and going out and seeing that if everybody was the same, it'd be why go on a trip like you went on? Oh, absolutely. So I think that's it's about you know it's about those local places and their individual individuality that is so beautiful. Absolutely. Um, but we don't need to have the gates and the and the <laughs> the borders up, right? But, but let everybody still have their difference. Right. Because that's right. What makes it so fun to go. Absolutely. Out Absolutely. And Absolutely. But we don't. We actually, you know, we have lots of barriers to that kind of exchange, right? That that a lot of people. There are some people who can. Well, no, but we have. Well, we do have a border wall and border surveillance and... Well, we have surveillance everywhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there are policies that keep well, people policies, from... policies, but there's also a lot of people who think, like, why would you do that? Mm. You yeah, that, well, that's, that's true. Fear, yes, yeah, absolutely. Fear. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Also, like, get your book. I was just wondering, you're really good at just um, seeing everyone's humanity and being a good listener. And I was just wondering if you've always been like that and why. collecting stories um, and I I don't know if that's a that's a really nice thing to say um, I know that with the the um, you know the Minneapolis interview project that I've been doing since that I've discovered that you know the best way to get the best story is to keep my mouth shut <laughs> you know you know you get and, and that's true as a teacher, too, I've, I discovered, you know, after years of thinking I had to sh prove myself, et cetera, et cetera, but that if I just, you know, found ways to bring people out as opposed to showing, I know this, let me tell you, right? So. Okay, this is just kind of bouncing off a couple of different things, being a teacher and, um, ways of being resilient um, and I wanted to sort of share this program that keeps me uh, thinking positive thoughts about hopefulness <laughs> in our world and that is a program that's in Canada and it's been in the school systems or it's in every province of Canada and it's been there for 30 years and it's called Roots of Empathy and I encourage people to look it up and encourage our community to um, have this curriculum because I think it invites everyone to the table. Um, it's based on um, the uh, attachment of um, a primary caregiver, mostly it's been mothers um, and infants in the classroom where they sit around um, a, a green blanket and they watch 
uh, um, empathy develop. And um, it's from preschool through grade seven. And it's affected thousands of people in Canada, and it's changed a lot of things in Canada. And now we do have it in the United States, um, but it's mostly in Seattle, Washington, DC, um, New York, Hawaii, it's had a huge impact because of the indigenous people. Um, and it's in South Korea now. Thank you. So, any other fine last comments or questions? Thank you so much for having us and for having programs like this yep. and being open. <laughs>